Hello and welcome to this Convene webinar. Um, we're very glad that you are all able to join us. My name is Ryan McDuff coming to you from Southern California in our Convene headquarters. Um, very excited today to have all of you joining us um, and participating in this webinar uh, presented by Optivest, one of our sponsors for our last year's um, Leadership Summit, which happens each year. Um, for those of you that do not know who Convene is or maybe newer to Convene, I just want to introduce kind of who we are and what we do. Um, Convene is a trusted community of Christian CEOs and owners that propel each other into industry leading performance and purpose. Um, and so if you have any questions about that, that's that's applicable, applicable, applicable to you. Convene is and what we do and how we use peer-to-peer -peer or groups, one-to-ones, and different uh, ways to help and benefit CEOs, please feel free to reach out to us and contact us. I'm very pleased today to be providing more content to you uh, via one of our sponsors, Paul Donnelly of Optivest. Uh, Paul is going to be presenting today on investment banking and merger acquisitions. And a couple of notes for uh, participation as we're going through this. Depending on your browser or uh, whether you're in full screen mode or not watching this uh, webinar, the button to participate in Q&A throughout should be either at the bottom or at the top of your screen. Um, you can just click there, uh, enter any questions that you have as we're going, and Paul, as he's presenting, will either um, field the questions as he's presenting or will just handle some Q&A time at the end of our presentation. So uh, we should begin shortly and and wrap up at about 10.30. So just want to thank each of you for joining us and uh, want to introduce Paul now. Paul is a Senior Managing Director at Optivest IB. Um, Paul has uh, founded that organization after s spending 25 or more years in investment banking professional and has handled over $3.25 billion in transaction value for clients. Um, Paul is uh, bringing us today this presentation on mergers and acquisitions. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul and uh, thank you for joining us today. Paul? Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. And thank you for uh, those who have decided to dial in and participate in this webinar. And uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, uh, take the group through um, some slides that really address the topic related to M&A. Um, I'm sure everyone has had some influence or uh, flow of information their way as it relates to acquiring and or selling their business. And hopefully, uh, as we walk through some of these discussion points, we can shed some light on some uh, on some new topics and uh, uh, as well. Um, just to just to quickly give you uh, uh, just a, a little bit more summary background on myself, um, as Ryan alluded to. Um, I've spent approximately 25 years or more in the corporate finance world, either as an investor early on in my career with a venture capital fund um, or an advisor as an investment banking, um, starting initially uh, in New York with LF Rothschild and then spending over the last 20 years prior to the launching of Optivest IB uh, with a LA-based regional investment bank. And uh, it's given me the opportunity to work with uh, a lot of middle market stage companies, uh, both as it related to um, selling businesses, raising capital for companies, and or helping them buy, acquire companies or doing other valuation fairness opinions and other advisory work. So we're going to spend some time here this morning, again, just around the topic of mergers and acquisitions. You'll hear the acronym m and um, which is just synonymous. And, uh, and so um, as we kind of roll into the, the initial slide, first of all, um, please feel free to jot down my contact information, email or phone number if by chance you want to follow up. I could send you uh, this presentation. Um, or if you have any follow-up questions, uh, my contact information is listed there on the screen. And uh, I'll give you a second if anybody wants to jot down the information. Um, you'll see a few, um, hopefully, uh, cartoons that'll give you a chuckle. And uh, but uh, let's let's kind of dive right into it. And really, when we talk about M and think it's important for 
um, an owner, owner operator of a business to really ask the question, who am I as it relates to the business? And that really helps drive the exit strategy. Um, first of all, I've highlighted here on the X and the Y axis, um, the stages of development of a business from the early stage to emerging growth to lower middle market to a middle market stage. And you hear the term middle market in kind of public company terms and Wall Street terms. It tends to be companies that are north of the billion dollars, but you'll hear a lot of middle market. And I really, I view it more in a practical sense. That tends to be transactions that are probably more like, you know, 100 or 200 million or larger. And then lower middle market, I would put more in that kind of sub $100 million range. Um, the stages of capital that I, I've listed here, it's, it's more as a tutorial. Um, as you're developing a business and accessing capital initially, angel investors or friends and family become a primary source of capital. And then as you move along the stage of development of the business, you'll hear the term venture capital, um, then growth, private equity, and then uh, more access to the debt markets, whether it's senior debt or subordinated debt, and then access to further liquidity, whether it is the actual M&A or sell of a company or accessing the public market. So it just kind of puts a framework but the important thing in, in really evaluating and and uh, exploring who you are as a business is is really I break it into two categories. What I call lifestyle businesses, or return invested capital businesses, and and the lifestyle business is at the end of the day, it's the business that probably does not lend itself to an exit strategy whereby there is a some type of capital event or liquidity event driven by some value to the business to a third party. And there's some reasons why often, and I've listed some highlights, um, the assets go home at night. Um, there may be significant customer concentration um, or the business may be, in many cases, some service-oriented businesses that's execution-driven, but really no barriers to entry. Often these types of businesses are um, are great cash flow businesses. Um, it's you know uh, the the owner of the business is really the driver of the business, and therefore the risk to a buyer might be if that owner is no longer engaged that it would have a material impact on the performance of the business. There's nothing wrong with lifestyle businesses, and generally, my advice is when we help assess that is to, hey, enjoy um, growing your business, um, have it produce um, excellent financial results, and then take the, the fruit of those results and be a good investor to start to build your own personal assets for as you start to look for to build some liquidity and, uh, and value for your efforts. The opposite is uh, the more M&A-driven event, return on capital, and whereby taking the capital instead of paying yourself putting it back into the business in one form or another because it will continue that investment in the business will continue to grow the value of the business. And these become businesses that are beyond often uh, the identity of the uh, owner operator, but where there is a team, where there is a business model that has leverage, leverage through either a technology position, um, leverage from a significant cost advantage, um, where there's some barriers to entry, where there's some brand leadership. These are the things that start to drive um, an exit value for a prospective buyer that they can leverage and then continue to scale. So the really, first of all, in M&A, we, uh, we kind of go through that exercise at least assessing um, what side of the equation you fall on. Um, so what is uh, merger and acquisitions? And uh, and we really simply break it down. The sell side is you're receiving value if you're the seller and you're giving up control. And the buy side is basically you're delivering value and getting control. And I think one element that one needs to pay attention to, and I've, I've often advised, especially in transactions where the seller is receiving consideration that is materially in the form of the buyer stock, I remind the buyer that, that or I remind the seller, excuse me, that this transaction is them being more of a buyer, whereby for consideration of handing the buyer the company, they are buying the seller's stock. And and just as long as all parties are aware of that, especially the 
seller per se, that they're effectively um, making a decision that the path for liquidity or the best exit is them potentially owning someone else's stock in consideration for handing them their company. Um, as we move on to slide seven, um, let's touch on, so why sell and why sell now? And I, and I really break it down to these elements. The human element is, is really driven by, could be a number of factors. Um, one of the you know, primary factors, it could be a health issue by the owner operator where at this point, um, they're at a season in their life where they're not in a position to continue to uh, operate the business and, uh, and based on their options relative to their team and the company and the market position, it may be a good time to transition uh, the business to another party. Uh, the, along the human element, it could be obviously succession planning. And uh, it could be the business being handed down to a family member or to a management team, and that's driving a transaction that would provide some liquidity um, for the owner operator, but also um, provide an opportunity for a uh, succession plan and ownership to be passed down um, to other parties. Um, the market element is uh, is one that is an important driver of a transaction, and it's one we spend a lot of time talking about, and we'll touch on it in more detail later. But that's where there's dynamics in the market, there's forces in the marketplace, consolidation, and so forth that may be fueling um, the timing of a transaction independent of the company and where it's at in its own stage of development. And we'll touch maybe on that a little bit more later. The offensive element may be a, a case where there's an opportunity for um, the, the company to consolidate the industry or seize an opportunity um, uh, to be um, acquiring other companies, um, to take a leadership position, to gain market share and so forth, um, because the company is moving into a leadership position. The alternative on the defense, it may be the industry. There's some industry changes in the dynamics of the industries and the players and the competitive profile and the company's own performance that the future looks, uh, appears to have more risk associated with it um, than where the business is currently operating at, whereby the owner recognizes it's probably better to make a move now versus maybe hanging on based on some of those factors. So let's touch on uh, on slide eight. So where does your business fit in the value chain? And uh, I think it, you know, it, just understanding your industry, you know your business well, um, understanding where you fit in the value chain. Are you with a small small fish or smaller big fish in a bigger small pond? And that could be where you position relative to the industry participants, how large your market is. Um, and all those things can affect what your business profile looks like and how the market values your business. Um, are you, you know, uh, providing a best of breed or leading edge technology or solution? Or are you um, doing something more revolutionary in the market space that's what I call a game changer? Um, or is your business more provides a gap filler um, for a prospective buyer where it might be a hole in their product line that you represent filling the need in that product line and so forth? Or are you a commodity player in a commodity market? And uh, all those things in assessing and understanding where where you fit in the value chain is important as you go through kind of the M&A process and planning. So when to sell? And this is... Uh, this is always a challenging discussion that I run into what I would call owner operators. And uh, especially when I talk about owner operators, really I'm talking about where um, the owner of the business is still active in the business, was the founder of the business most likely, or acquired it and has taken it to the next level where uh, in many cases, this may, this may be the first and only liquidity opportunity in their career relative to building a company. Um, and uh, where their heart and soul and emotions are tied into the business. And the when to sell um, becomes uh, an important topic of discussion. And uh, it's not unique for me to run into that classic owner-operator who 
thinks it's time to sell, but also says, gee, next year, our, we believe both our revenues and earnings are going to be up 20%. And so maybe I hold off a year because I can do the multiple math on the multiple of that. And that's how many dollars I'm leaving on the table. And then they kind of keep going into that mentality and may lose sight of the forest for the trees into what's going on in the market. Um, or they want to get to the peak and, uh, and get the business clicking on all cylinders, you know, reaching the top of the peak. And then with all that in their rear view mirror, want a pot potential buyer to pay them a premium. Yet looking through the front windshield, um, growth now is starting to slow. The market is, you know, they've reached saturation points and so forth. So we're very careful to help um, the owner operator really process and think about um, leaving some growth, leaving some momentum on the table for the buyer to buy into. And uh, emotionally, that can be hard. And uh, so I call kind of selling it. If you look at my diagram, you know, camp two to camp four, but, but at the peak when they're in diligence, if there's nothing but um, mat mature results that are in the forward um, visibility as far as growth slowing, earnings slowing, and so forth, it has a material impact on the multiple that they can pay for the business. So give them some growth um, that they can um, participate in post-ownership, and that will drive ultimately the optimum price in the transaction. Uh, moving on to slide 10. Uh, so, and in continuing on when to sell, and I won't touch on all the details here, but the too early go zone and too late, you know, too early is, uh, is that owner operator who's excited about how well positioned their technology or solution is, um, and how much, how excited the market is, but there isn't quite enough validation or execution of that. And, and, uh, and so, um, there are certain circumstances where more pure technology plays that larger companies will acquire companies just for their technology and not their marketing or commercialization. But um, more often, we're running across that we need to validate um, that the utility of that technology or business model is proven out uh, in the marketplace and whereby maybe we're leaving room for the buyer to scale it but at least the proof of the business model has at least um, been established. Um, momentum in the business is in the go zone, and elements that uh, affect that um, will be things like the last bullet there, where there's also, in addition to the momentum in the business in it by itself, there's some other strategic benefits, whether it's channels, margins, bears to entry, um, and positioning for a buyer to help scale the business. Um, the too late is is what we touched on a little bit on the defensive. Um, there's changes in the industry dynamics, and you're starting to see evidence of that. Shrinking margins, we're losing market share, we're seeing some slowing of growth, and uh, and it's starting to drive some fear about the prospects in the business. As we touch on um, some company and valuation methodologies, and uh, uh, I'm sure a few of you can relate to the slide here uh, with the end. I'll quit when it stops being fun. Uh, but we, and I'll, I'll just highlight some of these. And, and these are relatively standard, but just for more uh, on an educational point of view. In businesses, you know, there, there are a number of ways to value companies. And um, strategic as well as financial buyers exercise this analysis in one form or another. It may not ultimately dictate the transaction value, but it is a filter that they go through, and it's uh, anywhere from looking at how are the public companies um, in your industry or like business models, how do they trade on value? And often those will be some form of multiples. It'll be multiples uh, in SaaS software companies, which is software service, 
you might see more multiples of revenue, um, which are driven by um, primarily growth. Uh, the multiples are driven by uh, growth of the business and uh, and the overall market. Um, you'll hear EBITDA multiples, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's kind of like the operating income of the business, the operating cash flow. Um, that's often a standard. Uh, that's a metric that gets uh, valued in a multiple applied to that. So how are the public companies uh, trading in value? And there's other forms of value. And then how about the M&A, which is other transactions that have occurred? And in the public markets, these are all disclosed if they're material relative to the acquirer or the seller, generally the acquirer. And these get disclosed in public filings and not in all cases do they disclose or require to disclose the price but if it's material enough generally you see some of those details and you can then extrapolate hey how have other businesses that have like business models or in my industry how are they valued in M&A transactions and then there's the fin kind of a financial discounted cash flow model that looks at projected cash flows of the business making certain assumptions and then applying a discount rate relative to the risk to say, hey, uh, here's what I think um, based on a discounted cash flow, the present value of those expected future cash flows, um, what that value is. And uh, that's kind of more of a t traditional kind of financial model. And you'll see um, that these get applied um, um, in addition to then looking at some of the strategic elements of what they can do with the company to affect the financial performance. Uh, so we touch on, so if we spend some time talking about what are drivers of value and some of the traditional drivers, as you might suspect here on the left, are just financial performance, market share, management team and their experience, you know, industry trends, uh, diversified customer base and so forth. Traditional things that people assess and looking at uh, assessing value. What are the things that kind of tend to move and drive premium values is obviously um, where you're growing at a much uh, higher rate than your peers in the industry, both from a revenue and an earnings point of view, most likely than gaining share in the marketplace. Um, the diversity in your customer base, uh, the company is recognized as an industry leader where there truly are some barriers to entry from competing solutions or companies entering markets so you can protect um, your business. We kind of call it moats, you know, putting moats around your business. Um, and then touching on, you know, best of class products or services or pricing and elasticity. All those things are examples of some things that move you into drivers of premium values. But one thing I do remind people because often in these discussions, the seller can get um, get pretty enticed and elated about all the synergies that are going on and why that buyer should pay some unique premium. But I do remind them that, hey, there aren't many M&A transactions I've done that at the end of the day at least didn't get assessed or processed through the CFO's desk. So um, there is both the analysis on the strategic side, but there's also going to be um, some analysis from, hey, from a financial point of view, if we're paying that value based on the assumptions, um, my management team as a buyer is looking at the business, are those assumptions reasonable that will produce results that fit well with our business? Um, what are some M&A deal killers? And, uh, and uh, um, I'll wrap up here in a couple of minutes on these next few slides. but. Uh, Seller and buyer expectation gap, and, and often I think probably our greatest value in the process and advising our clients is not only creating a process that will drive, um, you know, maximize value, and what I call optimum value, because it's the value that can get to the finish line, not just feel good because they gave us a letter of intent at a big high price, but then retraded the deal as they went through their due diligence, but but making sure we, we, we've we got a, a situation where I, I at the end of the day, there's a high level of confidence a transaction can be completed because there's reasonable alignment on the expectation 
side and the gap's not too large. There's social issues. Um, what roles will certain parties play post-transaction? Very important. Um, obviously, the due diligence side is it's very important, I believe, to make sure when we're ready to make a decision to go into a letter of intent with a prospective buyer, we feel confident that they understand what our business is, what it looks like, and uh, both the pros and the cons, whereby we can then um, have a higher level of of confidence of a closing because we know the buyer is setting a price based on reasonably well-informed information. Um, uh, we're very careful to be drive the transaction so high in a competitive process that one little piece of diligence information could cause it to unravel, where we pushed it too far to the limit, where now the buyer is um, is looking for something that they can justifiably come back and say, you know what, we wanted to pay this price, but because of these two things, uh, we need to adjust our price. And that can have all kinds of impacts on the overall process, um, not just between you and that prospective buyer. Material adverse change in the business during the process obviously can kill a deal. And then there's indemnification and reps and warranties that are part of um, documentation and the process that both the buyer and the seller need to agree to. Um, let me just highlight uh, on the transaction planning and process. Um, I really call this, if we're setting back and saying, what are the planning stage if you're thinking about, hey, in the next 12 months, I might want to entertain uh, you know, a process on the M&A. And I, I really list it as uh, looking at the positioning of your company and then the actual performance of the process and then how you participate. And you can see that some of the preparation aspects in positioning is, you know, positioning the company, your business plan, looking at what the team needs to look like or the corporate structure, the financial reporting. In other words, getting yourself ready, um, looking at the exit risks, kind of your own SWOT analysis, um, looking at making sure there's shareholder alignment and so forth. And then when I say you as an owner operator is more personal, during this stage, you're in control, you're orchestrating, and you're starting to do some delegating. Now, who do you need alongside you at this stage? This is a stage where you're kind of bringing all your advisors in at the front end to um, uh, to advise on the various, uh, their core competencies as it relates to the businesses they advise you, whether it's your strategic advisor or board of directors, your accounting firm, your M&A, um, and trust attorney. Um, and your investment banker. And, uh, and then as you go on the performance side, now we're actually entering the process. We're getting ready to go to market. We're putting together the deliverables, um, which in the form is often a memorandum uh, and uh, confidential information memorandum. You'll hear the acronym SIM. And then uh, you're looking at um, various exit risks, timing in the market, you're now in the control, orchestrate, delegate, negotiate, and now you're in the pontificate mode at this stage. And again, you can see um, some of the key players that are working alongside. The participating is now we've completed a transaction, and now we're, at, we're entering into a new season, um, now dealing with the investment portfolios and passive income and so forth. Um, I know we want to wrap up here in a second. Quickly, transaction process outline. Generally, transactions are going to take four to nine months. It's not unique to be working on a deal that I find out later on, boy, we've been working on 12 months from when we initially were engaged to actually completing the transaction. Um, quickly, on go-to-market strategies, um, you'll hear often we go through either it's a full auction, targeted auction, or negotiated process. Um, that is kind of dictated by your audience and the size of the transaction. Obviously, in a full auction, it's a very broad group of broad buyers, um, maybe global. Generally, they're larger businesses, and we're running that much more as a, as a, as a full auction process to, to maximize a competitive dynamic. Many companies in the lower middle market will fall into I kind of call the targeted auction. These might be smaller to mid-sized businesses where there's a half a dozen very logical buyers for the business. Uh, often they may be industry participants. 
It doesn't mean the search doesn't expand outside them, but the process is probably much more geared towards a smaller audience and more targeted. And then the limited audience I call the negotiated process is often where it's a one-off where somebody wants to make a preemptive bid on the business. And in some cases, those can be very successful transactions as long as they understand they're, com- they're competing against what a broader auction would drive and what the owner-operator is willing to do. And in many cases, that might be a natural a competitor in the industry where there's a natural fit and they could rationalize paying the highest price. So on our last slide, really just talking about now we've kind of completed transaction, now what? And these are the questions that we, you know, start to enter into the discussions. Uh, It's where at OptiVest, we both, myself on the investment banking side and Mark Van Murek on the wealth management side, start to uh, engage in combination with our clients. Uh, What's the role? What's your role post-transaction? Are you going to resign and retire? Are you going to be a consultant? Or are you going to be running the now combined businesses or have a senior management role. Again, we touched on new responsibilities. We get into wealth management. We get into life management, faith, family, fitness, finance, and friends. And then we move into, um, you know, what's my next career? And uh, and you can touch on those. Um, so hopefully that will uh, touch on some various stages of M&A. Um, and if... Uh, Uh, If there's any questions, uh, I'll stand by here. Otherwise, thank you, everyone, for participating, and I hope it was uh, fruitful for you and your time. And again, if you have any questions, hopefully you had my contact or you can reach out to Ryan, or you can just uh, type in Optivest Investment Banking, and uh, our website will come up, and you'll find our contact information. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. We appreciate you uh, bringing this. Um, Because we are a little over time, I'm just going to wrap it up quickly uh, with a word of prayer. But as uh, as Paul mentioned, if you have any questions and would like to follow up with him, you can reach out to me. uh, Simply my name, Ryan McDuff at convenenow.com via email. Uh, or via the question uh, portal here, and I'll get back in touch with you and be, make sure that we're able to connect you with Paul. But let me just wrap us up in prayer and uh, thank you for joining us today. Heavenly Father, uh, we praise you and we thank you for this time where we are able to come together and um, learn new information from a brother in Christ, Father. And I pray that as we continue to move forward um, in our businesses and in our ventures, Father, that as opportunities arise, that you continue to bring um, brothers and sisters in the kingdom together to help one another um, as we pursue you through our businesses, Father. We thank you for this time, and we thank you for Paul and his expertise and being willing to share with us. And we pray that you would just bless all those who participated today, as well as who have made be watching online. We just pray that you would bless their day as they continue forward pursuing you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much again, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, Brian.